Welcome again to Christianity University. This is Christianity 103. We trust that you have completed 101 and 102. We cannot emphasize enough the importance of understanding the penalty of sin, which is death, and all of the mechanics concerning death, and then, of course, the types and shadows of the gospel which we have covered in Christianity 102. So if you have not completed those two sessions, please do so before you continue. Because it all ties together, this is like a great jigsaw puzzle that comes together. We left the last lesson with this question. As the Apostle Peter was preaching to the people, the Jews, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, or they felt the conviction, and they realized they were guilty, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, you already know the, the most important question. But before we talk about the answer, let's talk about faith. The scripture says, without faith it is impossible to please him or God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now there are two kinds of faith, passive and active. For example, it takes no action to believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. It takes no action, no involvement to believe that the sky is blue. But if you have faith that you're in a burning building, your faith will demand action. You need to do something. Faith demands action. You're going to get out of the building. Let's read what the scripture says in the epistle of James. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Them depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What benefit has it done? Has it done you any good? No. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. And then he said, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. Action is required. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. He did something about it. Action required. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He could have sat there and it could have rained on him and he would have died with everyone else had he not got up and did something about that which he believed was going to happen. He built an ark. Action required. And so when we consider this question, we must consider the fact that action is required. Action required. During the last Egyptian plague, we saw how that the people of Israel had to apply the blood to the doorpost of the house in order to be safe. For us to be safe today, we too must apply the blood of Jesus. How? is this done. Remember the brazen altar, the place of death, as the priest slew the sacrifice, and as Jesus became the lamb that was slain, we too must die to self. This is called repentance. Now after that John, John the Baptist was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel 
the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. The gospel was the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and we begin the obedience of the gospel by our death, or by repentance. And then as the priest left the brazen altar, or the place of death, where did he go? He went to the laver, the brazen laver, the basin to wash. And as Jesus was taken from the cross, he was buried in a tomb. We follow the priest to the laver, and we follow Jesus to his tomb, when we are buried with him in baptism. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Water baptism is being planted together in the likeness of his death. Death and burial. But don't forget, the priest did not end at the laver. Neither was Jesus left in the tomb. Jesus rose from the dead, and neither are we left at the water of baptism. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. There's death and burial. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Notice what Jesus said. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly, or his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. And you might say, but I don't quite understand what that means. In parentheses, the writer of the book explained it. He said, but this spake he of the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There are several things we want to look at here. The first one is that we see that there is a promise there is a promise of the Holy Ghost. He that believeth on me, verse 38, as the scripture has said, out of his belly or his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. And then it gives us clear understanding of what this means. This spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him not might, not possibly, but should receive. And then he said, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. What does that mean? This means that before Jesus could pour out his Spirit upon humanity, he first of all had to settle the score with Satan. He had a head to bruise. He had to conquer sin in the flesh. The requirement to be glorified. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. In other words, his flesh, his flesh said, I don't want to do this. But the Spirit says, For this cause came I unto this hour. This is the reason why Jesus came into the world. This is the reason why God was made 
human flesh. He came for this purpose. What was the purpose? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The one who rebelled in heaven, the one who is the prince of the power of the air, he is now going to receive his just due. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. He was telling his disciples, he said, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. What is the Comforter? The Comforter is the Holy Ghost. The Comforter is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Comforter is the Spirit of God. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. He had to be glorified for this purpose. Before he could pour out his spirit upon the world, he who knew no sin had to pay the penalty of sin by legitimately purchasing our salvation. For as much as ye you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, was manifest in these last times for you. So by dying, he conquered sin in the flesh, was glorified, and is now able to redeem us. So after Jesus is glorified, he gives us the promise that he will pour out his Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The scripture says that we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. After Jesus is glorified, the Holy Ghost raises us up from the watery grave of baptism. The faith of the operation of God is the Holy Ghost. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So there it is. Death, burial, and resurrection. Repentance, water baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gospel, or the good news, is the new birth, the death and the burial and the resurrection. Notice this. There was a man of the Pharisees, which was a division of the Jews, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus, notice what Jesus answered. He said, verily, verily. Now remember, we said every time you hear the word verily, verily, listen up. He's saying, certainly, certainly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he can not see the kingdom of of God. As Jesus had to be glorified, we too must be glorified with him through his death, which is repentance, his burial, which is water baptism, and by the resurrection, which is the Holy Ghost baptism. We must understand that we are dead in sin. We are on our way to the second death. That is the reason why we must be born again. 
Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We must understand the importance of the new birth. Nicodemus didn't understand it. So many people do not understand. It is very, very clear. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, a second time, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Here again we see him saying, certainly, certainly. And then, marvel not, don't let that blow your mind that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Why must a person be born again? Because they're on their way to the second death, because of the penalty of sin. And because of sin, Jesus made a way out. The scripture says, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's not an automatic thing just because we live in America that we're all automatically going to heaven. That is not true. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is on his way to the second death. But notice this. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Jesus does not send people to hell. They're already on their way, and he has given us a way of escape. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. And this all has to do with the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And he said, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And after the crucifixion, Jesus gave explicit instructions to his disciples. Let's read it. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. And he's referring to hundreds, hundreds of prophecies, re beginning with that one messianic prophecy about bruising the head of the serpent. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The word behoove means to be compelled through what is necessary to accomplish a goal. For our sakes, Jesus had to die in order to purchase our redemption. And that repentance and remission of sins, death and burial, should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's important for us to realize that what was to take place in Jerusalem would be the pattern or the template that would take place throughout the world. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, not just in Jerusalem, but beginning in Jerusalem among all nations. In just a moment, we're going to be going to Jerusalem to see the fulfillment of all these things take place. We're on our way 
to Jerusalem. Yes, repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And Jesus also said, Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye, or wait, in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. What promise is that? The promise of the Holy Ghost. And ye shall be endued with power. We're going to see this take place when we turn to the Acts of the Apostles. So now, let us travel to Jerusalem and let us see it unfold. Let's turn to the book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles. As we turn to the book of Acts, it is important for us to realize what this book really is. First of all, we must understand that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are books that are written that are a narrative of the birth and the ministry of Jesus, which tell about his death and burial and resurrection, or the Gospel. And the four Gospels bring us to the door. The Acts of the Apostles is the history of the early church, which is the door. So the four Gospels brings us to the door. The Acts of the Apostles is the door. And the Epistles are letters written to the church which teach us how to live once we are through the door. It's very simple. It's very important that we rightly divide the word of truth. The Acts of the Apostles, or the Book of Acts, the history of the early church, is the door. Who is the author? The author is Luke, the one who wrote what we had just read. Ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. So when we begin to read the book of Acts, after we have read the book of Luke, we have a seamless account of of events. As we begin the book of Acts, it begins with this. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. What former treatise was he talking about? He was referring to the Gospel of Luke. Both the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were written to a man by the name of Theophilus, which means friend of God. And Luke begins the narrative of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto his apostles whom he had chosen and we read all of that in the in the Gospel of Luke to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion his passion being his desire to fulfill this goal of purchasing our salvation by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God telling them things so they would be clear as to what to do and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he ye have heard of me. For John, and he was referring to John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Remember what John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And so here we're seeing it come together, but the disciples when they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Are we going to have our nation back? Are we going to kick out the Romans out of Israel? And Jesus said, No, 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 no. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Don't worry about those things. That's not the way it's going to happen. 
but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What takes place in Jerusalem will be the pattern or the template that will take place throughout the entire earth. Jesus ascends, and the apostles begin. When they had heard these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. Jesus is coming again, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, just like Jesus commanded them to do, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey, about a 45-minute walk. And when they were come in, went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotus, Judas the brother of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. What were they doing? They were praying. They were waiting. They were waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. And in the next segment, we're going to see this take place. The promise is fulfilled. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. What does Pentecost mean? Pentecost means 50 days after Passover. Remember the Passover. That was the Passover. Jesus became the Passover lamb. Pentecost is also the feast of the first fruits. Jesus became the first fruits of the first resurrection. And now we are witnessing what took place at the feast of the first fruits. Remember, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Jesus, his resurrection became the first fruits of the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Let's read about it. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept or are dead. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. So here we are on the day of Pentecost, the feast of the firstfruits of the first resurrection. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This took place at the feast of the first fruits of them that slept, the first resurrection. They are filled with the Holy Ghost, 
just like Jesus had promised. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They didn't understand what's going on. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They all have one dialect. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Pergia, Pampalia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What's going on? And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking, said, These men are drunk, they're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Will you listen to what I've got to say? Now, we stop here for a moment to ask this question. Why was it the Apostle Peter? The reason it was is because during the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, he said to Peter, Jesus said, Thou art Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What did he mean by this? Jesus was not referring to some succession of power that forever inflicts medieval superstitions and fables upon people. Instead, he was referring to this particular moment in history when he would unlock the kingdom of God with the knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of of Jesus. And so it was the man with the plan that lifted up his voice and said, Hearken to my words, for these are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And what the Apostle Peter does is he he quotes scripture from the Old Testament to prove to his Jewish audience that this truly was the one that came to fulfill the prophecies. And he begins to bring these scriptures out. And then he sums it up in verse number 22. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. In other words, you know he wasn't a fake. You know that he was real. This would have been a good time for someone to step forward and say, wait a second, no, he's not real. I was in on the deal. It was all a fake. It was all rigged. But no, they knew he was a man approved of God among them. And then he said, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This was all foreordained. It had to be for the purchase of our redemption. And then he said, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And then he said, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Why? Because he had done nothing worthy of death. Death could not hold him. He showed them by Old Testament scripture that Jesus was the one that fulfilled all these promises. 
And then he said in verse number 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles. And here is the most important question ever asked. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And we are now witnesses, not just of the most important question ever asked, but the answer to it, given by none other than the one that Jesus had entrusted the keys to the kingdom of heaven to. And here he gives the answer. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here we see it, clear as crystal. Death, which is repentance, burial, which is water baptism, in his name, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He answers it with the gospel message, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the believer. Repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Death, burial, and resurrection. And then, after unlocking the door of salvation, he told them that this was a promise. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Jesus had said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, not just in Jerusalem, but beginning in Jerusalem. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So we see that this promise, the promise of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost is a promise. The promise is unto you in this year, in the 21st century, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. I've got a way to escape. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. He's got a way out for us. And that way out is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We've come a long ways in three lessons. We've been able to teach why we need a Savior and the mechanics of life and death. We have taught how our Savior saved us 
and what exactly did Jesus do for us? And then we taught the most important question and the answer. We sincerely hope that we have helped you to understand the core and the foundation of Christianity, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there's any way we can help you to receive what God has promised, we stand ready, willing, and able to help. May God bless you in the name of Jesus. The next subject is Christianity 104, Christianity in Action.